Dear friends, good evening, good afternoon, good morning. This is our first Yes Online conversation in 2021. And I really want to hear this. Uh, for me, this is, uh, so to say, the intellectual inauguration of the year. Uh, Yalta European Strategy decided to organize these conversations for three main reasons. First, uh, the mankind uh, now in the center of big crisis and big threats, and uh, I'm afraid that huge, maybe even much bigger threats ahead of us. I mean threats related to uh, climate change, uh, uh, technological disruptions, and uh, maybe much more severe pandemics. Second, uh, we believe that mankind uh, needs an action plan. And number three, as yes, we uh, uh, think that uh, we need we need a global conversation, global brainstorming on such an action plan with participation of the best thinkers on the planet. And today with us, we have really two extraordinary thinkers, two great historians, philosophers, Yuval Noah Harari and Rutger Bregman. They wrote fantastic books, including Sapiens and uh, Humankind. And uh, I hope that today's conversation will contribute in uh, shaping an agenda for sapiens and uh, humankind for nearest future. And uh, 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 will help to take a broad look on where we come from, who we are, and where we are going. And very important that Zani Ment and Bedas agreed to moderate this conversation. I'm really honored and uh, uh, thrilled. Uh, I keep it short because we have only one and a half hours, and it's definitely not enough to make an, an agenda for the mankind. That's why, Zani, the floor is yours. Thank you, Victor. Thank you to the Yalta European Strategy. Thank you for putting on this conversation. Like you, Victor, I am immensely uh, excited to hear this conversation. I mean, a conversation between two really remarkable individuals, brilliantly original, thought-provoking thinkers and writers. I think both of you draw insights from the grand sweep of history with what I might say is swashbuckling confidence. Uh, you're outstanding writers, both of you. Um, and not surprisingly, you've both been immensely successful. And, and Victor has, has given a summary of your, of your bestsellers. Um, so he set the bar high. He says we're going to have the intellectual inauguration of the year. So it's up to the two of you to, to come up with that and live up to that. He set a very high bar. Um, but I am delighted to, to be able to listen in on and to gently steer the conversation between two such brilliant minds. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things. I'm sure many of you will have questions. Please do type in the questions. There's an ability to do that on your screens in front of you. And I will try and weave them into the conversation as and when appropriate. And we may come to some more questions at the end. But what I thought I'd do to try and uh, kind of live up to the schema that Victor has laid out of laying out an agenda for the future is first to get a sense from the two of you of the past, because you do have very different views of the past and how we should interpret it. And then equipped with that, I think I'd like to look forward and see where you think we are heading. And Rutger Bregman, why don't we start with you on the assumption, and this may be a rash assumption, but on the assumption that absolutely everybody listening to this has read Yuval's books, mm -hmm. and the possible assumption that they may not yet have read your latest book because it's only been out. It's very years. likely, yeah. <laughs> so you, you wrote <laughs> Humankind. You obviously, you shot to fame with uh, your book Utopia for Realists, um, where you became uh, a global phenomenon almost overnight. Uh, last year, you came out with Humankind, A Hopeful History. Perhaps you can set us our conversation off by giving a kind of brief um, summary of why you are hopeful of humankind. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the big questions that both historians and philosophers, and I think both Yuval and me, have been interested in for such a long time is what makes human beings special? Uh, why did we conquer the globe? What, what is our secret superpower? 
Um, for a very long time, we like to believe that, you know, it must have been God's plan that we were chosen by some kind of God um, and that we're sort of the pinnacle of his creation. Now, obviously, when the Enlightenment came and the scientific re revolution, people started to come up with a different explanation. They said, well, um, maybe it wasn't the gods who chose us, but maybe we're the product of evolution and we're just the smartest of all the animals. We have these huge brains, this incredible cognitive capacity, and that distinguishes us from the rest of the animal kingdom. Now, the problem there is that if you do an intelligence test and you let, say, uh, a human toddler compete with a pig or... Um, or in chimpanzee, for example, uh, quite often the animals win. So individually, humans are, are not that impressive. So we have to come up with a different explanation. What is it that really distinguishes us? Why do we build cathedrals and spaceships? Why have we conquered this globe? And I think that it is our capacity to work together, to cooperate. You could even call it, in the words of one evolutionary anthropologist, survival of the friendliest. This, this friendliness is really our secret superpower. Uh, the scientific term for this is uh, self-domestication theory. So the idea is that over the millennia, we sort of domesticated ourselves for a very long time. It was actually the friendliest among us who had the most kids and so had the biggest chance of passing on their genes to the next generation. And I think it's really important that people know this, that science has arrived at a, at a different, a new, more hopeful view of human nature because that has major implications for how we organize everything, basically, how we do democracy, how we, you know, design our workplaces, our schools, et cetera, et cetera. But that's sort of the short summary of what I'm thinking about. So, so it is, I think you've, you've almost underplayed the optimism which imbues your book, that, that it's, and it's homo puppy, not homo economicus or indeed homo sapiens, it's homo puppy is your yeah. worldview. Uh, you, wrote, you wrote on the cover of um, Wutger's book, the following commendation. You said, humankind challenged me and made me see humanity from a fresh perspective. So I'm going to ask you to respond to that. But just before you do, I wanted to raise the stakes even more for you uh, by saying that uh, I just noticed that less than an hour ago, uh, President Zelensky tweeted that he is glad that H Hariri at Yuval will be at the Yes Ukraine today. Humanity needs to overcome not only COVID-19, but mostly our inner demons, our own hatred, our greed and ignorance. And on the tweet goes. So the stakes are high. You have um, people who can change the world listening. Well, I mean... I really admire the, the, the book, Humankind, I really enjoyed it, and it did change my perspective on, on our species. I completely agree that our secret superpower is the ability to cooperate in very large numbers. I'm not sure that friendliness is what enables us to cooperate in very large numbers. Friendliness is key for cooperation in small numbers, 10 people, 50 people, 100 people. But when you try to get a million people to cooperate, or when you try to get, to get 8 billion people to cooperate against a virus, against a pandemic, I don't think that the friendliness in us, which is real, is the key to that. Um, I believe that uh, it's our storytelling capacity. It's the ability to convince millions, sometimes billions of people to believe in the same story. And um, it doesn't even have, have to be a true story. Uh, to put it in a provocative way, I would say that we control the, the planet and not the chimpanzees because we believe a lot more fictions, a lot more nonsense than the chimpanzees. So let me go back and before we go forward um, and, and how the impact of the pandemic and so forth, let's go right back because I think you both, you differ somewhat. You both acknowledge that something important happened um, when, when the Neanderthals era was ended and Homo sapiens kind of took over. But I think you have different interpretations of how and why that happened. And it feeds into your narrative, Yuval, about the power of storytelling and mm -hmm. Rutka into your power, your, yours about... I think sedentary agriculture and property rights more, mm -hmm. but can, can you both give a sense of what happened at that very early period that shaped your view of kind of how societies are organized? Rutger, you mm -hmm. first. Yeah, I think my, my view of human prehistory is maybe a little bit more hopeful and optimistic than <laughs> Yuval's is. So there's this long debate, for example, about violence and war in our history. When did it start? Or has it always been with us? Have we always, you know, 
been uh, quite violent. And I am on the side of the, uh, the optimists or the hippies, I would say. I think that really, if you look at the, the most recent anthropological and archaeological evidence, that you see that there's very little evidence for warfare uh, for the biggest part of our, our history, you know, when we were nomadic and gatherers you know, that's, that's basically around 95% of our history. And that it was really with um, the moment that we became sedentary and sort of invented civilization that basically everything went downhill. You know, from that moment on, we got hierarchy, we got the patriarchy, we got all these infection diseases like the plague and measles and COVID-19, et cetera, et cetera. So that's really um, sort of our original sin, uh, or as, as Jared Diamond once called it, uh, the biggest mistake in all of human history. Um, and... Indeed, if you want to ask the question, why are we the ones that who who have survived? Sort of, why not the Neanderthals? I've re, I, and that there, what's really key there is is indeed our our capacity to work in bigger bigger groups. And it's just it's not just the storytelling. I mean, I, I do agree with you, Val, that that's incredibly important. And um, and especially as these stories became bigger, I would say though that the role of of power is very important here as well. You know, the Italian philosopher Machiavelli once said that all the unarmed prophets throughout history, they failed and the armed prophets, they've been successful because it's much easier for someone to, you know, to get to believe your story if there's a man with an AK-47 standing behind you. Right. So it's, it's also with the power of money. We don't just believe that because, uh, well, we just all agree to believe in the power of the dollar. But if you don't pay your taxes, well, then they lock you up. So we don't really have an option of not believing. So, so Yuval, I'll turn to you in a second, but you, okay, let me just push you a bit on that, because you said mm -hmm. something quite striking just then. You said the moment we invented civilization that everything started to go downhill. Yeah. Um, do you really believe that? Do you, are you harking back to some kind of nirvana of, of you know, pre-civilizational <laughs> living? Well, look, we've obviously made incredible progress in the last 200 years. So obviously, I wouldn't want to go back and live as a nomadic and together. That would be, that would be quite silly. But it is, I think, important to recognize, and I think Yuval and I really agree on that, is that initially civilization and agriculture were, were not really good for the vast majority of people. You know, it really meant that you had to basically um, suffer uh, in, or, 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 you know, be a slave to some kind of landlord. What is your expression, Yuval? History is what like 1% of the population has been doing, while 99% of, <laughs> of people has been working on the fields. Um, I think that's really important to keep in mind and that there's, there's quite a lot of evidence that before that, when we lived as nomadic and togetherers, well, life wasn't obviously perfect. And you have, for example, very high child mortality. But if you could choose, you know, between a life as a farmer of, or as a nomadic forager, I would really choose yeah, the latter. Yuval, what, what, how do you see that turning point? Yeah, I generally agree, and I think that um, the huge disagreements about what happened before agriculture are less relevant here, partly because we don't have a lot of evidence, so uh, it's, it's very hard to decide on, on these matters, and partly because, you know, I mean, when I'm described as the, opti as the pessimist here, and Radgar is, as the optimist, I'm not sure. I mean, we are living in civilization, a very big one, and we can't go back. So if you see civilization as the root of all evil, I think you're more pessimistic than I am. Um, I think that, I mean, practically there is no way back. Now, again, to, 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 to come to the present crisis of the world, it is important to realize that epidemics are the result largely of civilization and agriculture. Hunter-gatherers in the Stone Age did not suffer from epidemics probably at all. I mean, almost all infectious diseases come to us from domesticated animals or from animals that we trade and keep in cages and so forth, and they spread because we live in dense, unhygienic, large towns and cities with networks of trade and, co and, and communication. So hunter-gatherers did not suffer from these things, even if by some chance a virus jumped from some wild bat to a hunter-gatherer 30,000 years ago, it would have infected this person, maybe 20 other persons, and that's it. There would be no epidemic. Epidemics started with civilization. 
but that doesn't really help us to deal with the present crisis because whatever the solution is to the COVID-19 crisis, going back to living as nomadic hunter-gatherers is not the solution. So yeah. I, I would say that um, I basically agree with the view expressed in humankind that human nature isn't evil and isn't the source of our problem. Humans are basically kind and friendly. The problem is that when you get millions of people together into large-scale societies, you have emergent phenomena like violence, like hierarchies, like exploitations, like slavery. And just knowing that the nature of individuals is kind and friendly is, again, it's important, mm -hmm. but it doesn't give us the solution for how to create better large-scale societies. We'll, we'll turn in a second to the, to the actual present day, but let's just keep on building the scaffolding of your two positions. And I think that's, um, Yuval, you've, you've put it extremely well. Rutger, the, 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 the challenge to you, I think, is one that, you know, we have 8 billion people on the planet now, so mm -hmm. it, it might be nice to think about. And let's, let's assume you're right, that, mm -hmm. you know, the basic nature of humankind is much more like homo puppy than, than anything else. And, mm -hmm. and we're, we're nice, charitable, friendly types. Mm -hmm. One, there's a lot of us now. Mm -hmm. uh, and two, do you think that the consequences of more people and the consequences, of, the negative consequences that we have seen throughout history where groups of people have done horrible things mm -hmm. are inevitable or are something that can be avoided? Well, look, I, I completely agree that you can, you can wonder, like, who cares <laughs> about nomadic and togetherers? We obviously can't go back. Um, and, uh, well, who cares if they were nice and relatively friendly and lived in these egalitarian societies? I would say, though, that it's still important because our view of human nature tends to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, you know, on the one hand, you can look at, at ideas and scientific theories and question, you know, their validity based on the evidence that we have. And, and sort of you can look at the debate and look at where is the scientific con consensus and what do people think now about how humans in general behave. And then I think it's relevant to know that indeed a lot of the you, sort of the selfish theories or the theories about human selfishness have gone down. So for example, we now know that when there's a, a small emergency or, or a big emergency, someone's drowning or attacked in the street, uh, based on camera evidence, we now know that in, in around 90% of all cases, people help each other. And that's good to know. I think that's mm. helpful to know. I guess one other aspect that I think you differ, and you're, you're agreeing too much with it. I want this to be mm. a debate, so we can't have yeah, you agreeing yeah. too much. I think we, we are approaching the areas of, 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 of disagreement. disagreement. Of disagreement. So, so one, I think, is whether you are at heart uh, analysts, observers, and chroniclers of the human condition and human history, or whether you have a, a view that it is changeable and you have a sort of an activist mentality, a social scientist mm. mentality that things can be changed. Where do you put yourself in that? No, I definitely think that things can be changed. I mean, even if human nature is a kind of given, I mean, and leaving aside issues of changing it with, with new technologies, um, and then the whole point is that you can take these individual building blocks, individual humans and, and families, and build out of them completely different kinds of societies. So I, again, I agree that the, 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 the question of human nature is important, but it's, it doesn't dictate how societies and, and civilizations actually look like. And maybe I'll give a concrete example. That, you know, when, when we talk about, for instance, the possibility of uh, establishing democratic regimes, democratic systems in, in different parts of the world. So it's good to know that originally democracy or some kind of a very egalitarian system in which everybody g gets a right to vote was characteristic of all human societies. Ancient hunter-gatherers, bands, were the most democratic systems that ever existed. There was no place for a hierarchy or for a dictator. If some bully came around, 
that the, at the last resort, people could vote with their feet. They could just go away. There was nothing this bully could do to them. There was, you know, there is no land, there is no money. There are, I mean, to survive, you need your personal skills in climbing trees and running after gazelles and your network of friends. And you can just take that and, and go somewhere else. So these were the most democratic systems that ever existed. Now, once you see the emergence of agriculture and cities and kingdoms, democracies actually become impossible except in a very local sense. Until the 18th century, you don't see any large scale democracies. Even the ancient examples like Athens and Rome and the other ancient democracies, they were all confined to single cities. Within Athens, you had a sort of democracy for 10% of the population. Not women, not slaves, but 10% still had a democracy, but only within Athens. Elsewhere, Athens was an empire. It was simply impossible to have a large scale democracy because you did not have the communication and transportation systems necessary. You couldn't have a public debate about the policies of the Roman Empire in the entire Roman Empire because communication was just too slow and people were not educated enough. Only in the 19th century, with the emergence of new technologies and new systems of communication and education, large-scale democracy becomes possible. So again, human nature did not change. Human nature was the same, basically, in an ancient hunter-gatherer band 20,000 years ago. It was the same in ancient Athens 2,000-something years ago. It was the same in the Roman Empire, and it's the same today. But the technology and the systems that combine these people into a political structure, this changed, and this continues to change also in the 21st century. So that, ha, hold that thought, because I want to come right back to that when we get uh, to looking forward. But Rutger, how do you respond to that? I mean, I'm, I suspect you would agree with that, 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 that the, the, the ways in which you can obviously communicate, interact, uh, have affected the potential for moving from your hunter-gatherer societies to where we are now. Yes, absolutely. And obviously, technology helps us to do democracy in a way that simply wasn't possible um, even decades ago. I think that the internet also gives us a lot of new possibilities. What I think I'm interested in, I guess, here, to, well, to, to, to look at the example of democracy, there's now a new movement of um, so-called deliberative democracy, where the idea is that if you treat citizens not as, as these apathetic individuals who only, you know, vote every four years after they've watched CNN for long enough, um, but actual people who are interested and engaged um, in politics and maybe want to take some responsibility themselves as well, then you could do democracy in a completely different way. So there's the example of participatory budgeting, for example, that a lot of cities around the globe now do, where a big part of the city budget is... Um, basically devoted to, um, to be spent by so-called big citizen assemblies and everyone can join. Um, also, the idea of sortition is really interesting. Obviously, the original Greek idea, as they practiced it in Athens, is that everyone would become a politician um, now in a while. I think that, that would be a really healthy idea as well, to move away from sort of the rule of the career politicians. But that, yeah, sort of everyone knows or uh, a politician in, in, in his or her so social circle. Um, I think all of these de ideas depend on a more hopeful view of human nature, because if you really believe that people are just selfish and lazy, then obviously that's not going to work. And that's how you're going to treat people. And you're, that's the kind of behavior that you're going to get out of them. If you turn it around and if you have a what I think is a more realistic view of what people can do, I think you can get very different kind of behavior. So let's let's turn now to the present. I, 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 you've agreed more than I hoped you would, but um, right. I, I think I think everybody listening will have a sense of your different perspectives. And, and Rutger is very much the hopeful side of human nature. I, I suspect you, while you are more of an observer of of, of kind of the evolution that uh, that has happened well, over history. Maybe if I can clarify, I think that um, you would have a, a greater disagreement if we brought somebody 
who thinks that humans are by nature bad and evil and tend to violence and, and so forth. And this is not the kind of disagreement that we have. Um, I think our main disagreement is not about the nature of individual people, it's about the nature of large-scale societies. And I, you can say that I'm a bit more pessimistic or somewhat more, more pessimistic, because I think that despite the basic good nature of individuals, when you get to the level of large-scale societies, you... Again, it's not inevitable. I'm not completely pessimistic. I'm mm -hmm. not saying everything is lost. Whenever you get a million people together, you get dictatorships and genocide and slavery. No, I don't think that. But I, um, I'm, I don't think that uh, positive outcomes are inevitable either. Mm -hmm. It can go either way. And for much of history, it went in a very negative direction. Only in the last 200 years or so do we see real, deep, sustained progress in large-scale human societies. Until say, around, until, say, the 19th century, you have immense technological development. The power of humankind goes up dramatically, but the conditions of individuals, humans, don't improve. You don't see any clear moral or ethical improvement. So over the long run, the evidence is not, is, I would say, is not very optimistic. And in the, yes, in the last two centuries, for various reasons we can discuss, we see sometimes improvement. But as I look to the future, uh, my main fear is that, you know, in the 21st century, given the power we have and the challenges we face, we can get it right nine out of 10 times. If we get it wrong once, that may be the end of us. Hmm. Our margins of error grow slimmer and slimmer. And when I look back in human history, um, it makes me a bit pessimistic, yes. If I can say something about this, Annie, because I think this really gets at the heart of it. You know, in a way, you can say that we're dancing on top of a volcano right now. Um, indeed, when you look at things like climate change or, or maybe the threat of AI or the, the extinction of species, it's really the question how, if we're, if we're basically going to survive, you know, for the next couple of centuries. Um, I, I, I think it's important to make the distinction between hope and optimism here. Optimism is, is a, I think, a form of complacency where you say, oh, look at all these wonderful graphs. Poverty is going down climate uh, or uh, child mortality is going down. We're richer, we're healthier. Life is better than ever. Don't worry, be happy. And I think that makes people lazy. The difference with hope is that hope sort of is, is about the possibility of change. It shows you that things can be different. And this is why I like history so much, by the way. History basically teaches you that there's nothing inevitable about the way we've structured our economy and society right mm -hmm. now. It, it cannot quite radically change. Um, but there's a real responsibility here for us as well. Um, one of the chapters in, in Sapiens um, has the title, there's no justice in history. And, and I can't agree more because there's, I mean, there's no, I, I don't believe there's a God that will, you know, reward the people who have suffered in this life, in an afterlife. There's no karma, there's no cosmic balance or anything. So if there is justice, then it has to come from people. And, and how, do we, how do we create that justice? How do we actually change the world? Well, I also agree, it often starts with telling different stories. So there's a real responsibility here. Um, and maybe that's, that's where our sort of approach is a little bit different, is that you, Yuval, you're sort of like the intellectual high up in the sky, looking down on people, you know, and, and trying to de deconstruct all their stories and their ideologies. Well, maybe I, my perspective is more from maybe the bottom up, and I, I, I'm trying to tell this different story that might, you know, change how people behave. because if they would actually believe in it, that people are not angels, but fundamentally decent, or at least pretty good, then I think that could re have really positive consequences and may even help us to survive in the next couple of centuries. But, but then maybe again to, to kind of, uh, I, I know that Zani and maybe many of the viewers want, want more disagreement here, mm -hmm. more kind of a clash of, of, of minds. Yeah. Maybe again to, to try to, 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 to pinpoint it, 
who's to blame? I mean, if human nature is basically decent, we are homo puppy, we are friendly, so how do you get slavery and genocide and the Nazis and the gulags and all that? Where, where, where is the problem? Yeah. Well, that's obviously the big question that hangs, <laughs> yeah. hangs over my book. Um, and when you cast away this sort of the simplistic explanation that says, oh, people are just evil and civilization mm -hmm. is a thin veneer, then obviously you have to think much harder about, you know, where, where does all this, all these war come from, all these, all these atrocities. And, and you, you could even say that in a way, humans are the cruelest species in, in the whole animal kingdom, right? There are no penguins that go in, in wars against each other or commit genocides or all these kind of horrible things. So I think what you need is obviously a very layered explanation. Um, there's not like this, I mean, libraries full of books have been written about it. But um, one really important thing to point, to point out here is this sort of the dark side of friendliness or the dark side of the fact that we've domesticated ourselves. Um, we are incredibly groupish. We are incre incredibly tribal. We just want to be liked. That's maybe the biggest problem of humanity. We just want to be part of a group. We don't want to be alone. And on the one hand, that's our secret superpower because it helps us to cooperate. Um, but sometimes it also really puts us against one another. I think one really interesting phenomenon that psychologists have discovered is that during wars, for example, most soldiers, sort of average drafted soldiers, are not motivated by ideological hatred or something like that, but by comradeship. They just don't want to let their friends down. Um, I'm not saying this to comfort people. I think it's actually very, very disturbing that, that we're often on the wrong side of history and we, we, we think we're just helping our friends. Um, but that is, that is the reality. And that's, it's also the big paradox, I guess, in my, my view of human nature, is that even though we're, we've evolved to be friendly and to work together, we're definitely not heroes. Uh, we find it very hard to go against our own. You know, I'm, I've, I've, for the past couple of months, I've studied... Um, resistance fighters in the Netherlands during the Second World War. And there's this one man called Arnold Dowis who built this huge underground network um, to help Jews hide from the Nazis. Uh, and he built this, um, this network in New London, which was one of the two places in all of Europe, uh, together with Le Chambon that you may know in, 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 mm -hmm. in France, that received the, you know, they all received the Yad Vashem Award as the Righteous Among the Nations. And um, this guy, Arnold Dowis, is the opposite of Homo Puppy. You know, he was a total pain in the ass. He always got into fights with everyone. People really disliked him. He was a sort of, like, he was a son of a preacher with communist sympathies before the war. His life was a total failure. Then the Second World War started and he did what no one else could, you know, because he really had the, the courage to, um, to do something there. Um, so that's, I recognize that paradox and I recognize that problem is that, um, and especially, you know, if times get tough, um, if, uh, if we're moving, for example, away from democracy and into authoritarian regimes, that asks so much more of people, then it's not good enough to be just friendly or decent anymore. It, life really asks more of you then. So, Rutger, I'm going to stop you there, because I think in the, in, in the last 10 minutes, you have given a very clear uh, sense of, of the of slight difference between your two approaches. And now I want to get concrete and forward looking, um, mm -hmm. because I think we'll, we'll bring your two big picture approaches on to trying to understand where we're now headed. And I guess the first question is, um, how do you see the last year, the pandemic, having challenged your own worldview and how big a deal do you think it will be? When, you know, the Rutger Bregman and the Yuval Hararis of the 22nd century are writing their books, is this a paragraph? Is it several pages? What, what scale of change have we been through? Uh, Yuval, you first. Well, the scale of change is, is too early to say. I mean, we're in the middle of it still. And whenever you're in the middle of something, it looks like the biggest thing that ever happened. But there is a chance that in 50, 60 years, people will hardly rem rem remember it. I mean, when you look back at, uh, the, I, I don't know, the 1918 influenza, which killed more people than the First World War, and it was hardly remembered. And, um, you know, there is not, a, I don't think, a, a single great work of art about the 1918, 1918, 19 influenza epidemic. Um, it all depends on, still on the decisions that we take in the coming weeks and months. I think the main lesson I would take from the last year, looking from a very broad perspective, 
is that it has been a year of tremendous scientific success and political failure. I mean, compared to any previous epidemic in history, we have done better and faster in understanding the epidemic and uh, um, understanding what to do about it. You know, when the Black Death spread, nobody had any idea what was happening, how to stop it, and, you know, cures and vaccines, nobody even thought about it. In 1918, 1919, the best scientists in the world at the time tried to find the pathogen causing the epidemic and failed. Most of the countermeasures they suggested were ineffective. And all the attempts to uh, produce a vaccine were futile. With COVID-19, it took only two weeks to correctly identify the virus and develop tests to know who, who has got it. Um, quite quickly, within a few months, we understood, or the scientific community understood, what countermeasures are best to stop the chains of infection. And within a year, less than a year, we have several effective vaccines. That's an amazing scientific success. Humankind has never been more powerful in its struggle against pathogens. We are much stronger than the virus. But the scientists are not politicians. It's not their job. They give us the tools. Now it's the job of politicians to use these tools. And it has been a year of a tremendous political failure, both on the level of particular countries, while some countries have been quite successful in stopping and containing the epidemic. You look at many other countries, the USA, Brazil, the UK come to mind, and leaders adopted disastrous policies. Even more so on the global level, a year after the, more than a year, after the beginning of this pandemic, there is no global leadership. There is no global plan of action of how to deal either with the virus itself or with the economic consequences. We are now in the midst of a vaccine arms race, which is, you know, it's, uh, countries are treating it like a um, sports competition who is the winner in vaccinating the largest number of citizens in your country without realizing that if you vaccinate only your people in your country, it doesn't give you real protection because, you know, if you, if you vaccinate 100% of Israelis or, or people in, in the UK and there is a new mutation in Brazil or South Africa or India or anywhere which makes the vaccine ineffective, then you will have a new wave of, of infection. As long as you allow the virus to continue to spread in anywhere in the world, it puts everybody in danger. And you know, this is basic science, but unfortunately it's far from basic politics. So the, the, I, I would say again, from the broad perspective, we have never been so successful scientifically, but politically uh, it's been a very disappointing year. Hutke, would you agree with that? That's a very clear way of putting it, scientific success and political failure. Hmm. So let me say why I'm a little bit more optimistic or hopeful, I should say. Um, <laughs> I think one very striking moment was in the beginning of the pandemic in April, I believe, when the Financial Times, sort of, what is it? The business paper of the, of the world basically published an editorial, well, after the economy, of course, uh, um, published this editorial where they sat back you know, it's probably time to, so, quote, reverse the policy direction of the last 40 years and think about ideas that used to be dismissed as unrealistic and unreasonable only just like five years ago and mm -hmm. have now really moved into the mainstream. Now, obviously, ideas that I personally really care about, such as a universal basic income, but also a higher taxation on, on the rich is really on the agenda now and um, sort of reimagining the role of the state. You know, for 40 years, we've talked about the state as, at best, sort of the, the helper or the assistant of the all-powerful great markets, right? And that the state, the job of the state was just to get people a good education and have nice 
fiscal um, uh, policies, et cetera. And then just to get out of the way, that basically was it. And then you're in the midst of a pandemic and you realize, hey, wait a minute, it's actually quite useful to have a well-financed, well-functioning government. And indeed, if you want to mobilize against big threats such as a pandemic, um, then uh, yeah, you sort of need that Leviathan, right? And I think as Israel is demonstrating here how, how, how you should do it, right? Or how quickly you can do that if you actually have pro proper functioning systems there. Um, I think that's really um, a shift in the, in the zeitgeist we're seeing here. Um, there, there, there are really um, many examples of that. Also of thinkers that have moved into the mainstream. Obviously, we've all heard about economists like Thomas Piketty, for example, that suddenly became, you know, his book went, went viral. I'm not, I'm not sure whether we all read it, but um, <laughs> it's somewhere on, on this bookshelf at least. Um, but there are, there are many uh, more, I think, important examples of this shift in economics. And um, that's very different from, I would say, 2008 with the financial crash when there also seemed to be this big crisis, but then we didn't really have an alternative. And therefore I think that 2020, I mean, it's obviously not this big turning point like the first world war, the second world war, but it may be similar to, let's say the, the oil crises of, of the 1970s that really did inaugurate the end of um, Keynesianism, you know, the, the rule of the power or of the ideas of John Maynard Keynes and inaugurated the era of neoliberalism. And I think that era may end now. Well, that, that sets us up. We're going to come to the economic side of that in just a second and the policy ideas. But first, I wanted to go back to where you have started, uh, where you said this has been a triumph of science, um, which I think we can all agree on. But it's also been a year where we've seen a tremendous acceleration of the technological forces and the technological forces mm -hmm. that you describe in your book, which with some fear and trepidation, I think, in, your, in, in, in terms of the pace at which the 21st century technologies are going to be changing the way we live, work, communicate with each other. And Thomas Fuss from Carlisle actually asked this question, a similar question, which is that the pandemic has been an accelerator of pre-existing disruptive trends, obvious in technology. It's also true in healthcare. But as Picasso said, before any great creation, there must be destruction. What risks do you see for countries with economies built on the strengths of the industrial revolution? And what would you do to advise those countries to mitigate those risks? So I think question one, do you agree that this has accelerated the forces, Yuval, that you wrote about before the pandemic? Does it make you more or less, um, you know, I would say you were quite pessimistic in your book. Are you more or less pessimistic about that? And what does it mean for existing economies? Well, I think it's, it's um, I'm not sure about the world acceleration because it implies that this was inevitable in any case and it's just happening faster. So it's more than just acceleration. It's kind of deciding on a lot of, you know, a lot of very important decisions about the shape of the world, the shape of the economy, the shape of the education system are being made very, very fast under the pressure of this pandemic. And this is, you know, it's, I mean, uh, it, it's quite dangerous. Um, many of the scenarios that I, I outlined before the pandemic, I didn't outline them as a prophecy, but just as a possibility. Maybe it will happen. I hope not. And now many of these things are, are actually happening, not just faster, but they are becoming legitimate. We are seeing the digitalization of more and more areas of life, like this very conference that, you know, a year ago, two years ago, it would be unacceptable. I mean, if they invited me to the Yalta European uh, 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 Forum and I would say, well, I'll, I'll do it, but I'll do it from home from my computer. They would say, no, 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 you, you have to come in person. I mean, are you kidding? From your computer, who does that? And now that's, that's acceptable and, and uh, I'm fine with it. I'm glad that at the end of, 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 of this event, um, I'm at home and no hotels and airports and airplanes and so forth. And I think planet Earth is also happy about that to some extent. But, um, you know, shifting the entire educational system online, that's a huge decision. And if you think about something like the, the new surveillance systems, this is really frightening. This crisis has legitimated not only in authoritarian regimes, but also in many democracies, new practices of mass surveillance. 
And um, this is likely, at least some of that, is likely to stay with us even after the crisis is over. And, you know, during the crisis, there is no time to have a, a, a deep public debate about it. Decisions are just being made very, very fast. So looking back from the future, if people do remember COVID-19 in 50 years, it is possible that they will remember it as the watershed moment when the world really turned digital and when mass surveillance became a normal and legitimate part of everyday life all over the world. Um, and, and that's cause for concern. If I, if I may add something here, I guess we've also seen like the real limits of digitalization. Um, for example, in the field of education, for a long time, it was quite fashionable to say, you know, that everything will go digital and that everyone can see the best talks by the top professors from the world on YouTube and that lots of professors around the globe would be out of a job because they wouldn't be able to compete with this, you know, this superstar professor. Mm -hmm. I think what we've actually seen in the last couple of months is that physical contact, actually seeing each other is incredibly important for proper education, that we are still a very physical creature. We haven't uploaded our brain into the cloud just yet. Um, that's, that's, I think, also one of the the lessons here. And um, I absolutely agree with you about sort of the uh, how worrying this, this trend of mass surveillance is, even though I would also say that some of the stories about, I don't know, companies like Cambridge Analytica hijacking our brains is, you know, not very believable. Um, mm -hmm. If you, for example, look at the evidence of the effectiveness of online advertising, well, quite often these, these algorithms can't even uh, distinguish the, you know, the gender of people, right? with the data set of Cambridge Analytica, for example. I think that a huge uh, part of that was just hype. And <laughs> a lot of companies make a lot of money these days with talking about machine intelligence and AI, while they just have some dumb algorithm that doesn't really understand the world. But maybe, maybe in the future, maybe in the future though. But I think that a lot of, a lot of that promise hasn't materialized yet. And it's not, it's not about to quite soon. There's, a, there's um, an interesting question from Ariel Cohn that I think fits into this conversation, which is the, the, the question about the current conflict between facts and fiction. So the fake news argument, mm -hmm. those who believe if you look at what's happened on the vaccine and so forth, it's been a tremendous year, as you say, for science and for belief in experts and belief in scientific progress. On the other hand, it's been a year where there's been an extraordinary practical consequence of the development of conspiracy theories and fake news and all of that. When you see those two together, Yuval, you know, which of those will be the more permanent phenomenon, do you think? Which is the more powerful? I think it, go, it goes together. I mean, people have this mistaken assumption that truth and fiction cannot coexist, that you cannot believe the experts and at the same time believe in all kinds of ridiculous conspiracy theories. But Again, I mean, history indicates that this is not, not, not the case. And humans have the ability to believe in the most nonsensical stuff in some areas and to turn to science and experts when they need to do something practical. I mean, to take an extreme example, if you think about Adolf Eichmann, um, uh, developing or, or, or preparing the timetables for the trains taking people from the Netherlands or from Hungary to Auschwitz and designing the gas chambers and how, how it all work. These are extremely rational people. They rely on the latest technology, on the latest science, on experts. They don't want any uh, fluffy uh, fake news. And at the same time, when it comes to their motivation, why do they do all that? It's because they believe a completely nonsensical pseudo-scientific uh, theory, which is at its heart is a conspiracy theory about the Jews controlling the world. Now, it's the same person with the same brain, with the same mind. But again, when listening to a speech by Hitler, 
it's as if they shut down the prefrontal cortex and their critical powers of evalu evaluation and, and rational thinking. And then once they get their mission, okay, you, you plan the timetable for the trains, puff, the prefrontal cortex goes back to action and is very meticulous and rational and, 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 and mathematical and, and so forth. And we see it in so many, again, I mean, if you think about the uh, September 11 attacks, it's the same people, when they adopted whatever theories they had, I mean, if I do this, I'll go to heaven and get so and so many virgins and whatever, it's the same people who were extremely rational and meticulous about planning the actual attacks. And what often people don't realize is that to accomplish big things, whether for good or bad, in history, you need both. You need both truth and fiction. Let's say you want to build an atom bomb. Now, to build an atom bomb, you need the truth of physics. If, you, if your theory of physics is wrong, you will not be able to build an atom bomb. At the same time, nobody is going to come together to help build the bomb just because you tell them E equals MC square. That motivates nobody. That's not an election slogan. E equals MC square. <laughs> you need some religious mythology, you need some political ideology, you need some economic theory to convince people, hundreds of thousands of people, to cooperate to build the atom bomb. Not just the physicists, the engineers, the technicians, the people who grow the food to feed the engineers and the technicians. And the mythology, the theory, the ideology that you use to unite them, it doesn't need to be true at all. It can be a, a, a bunch of fake news. It can be complete nonsense. And it can happen. Again, the same people can be extremely rational when dealing with some things and still believe the worst fake news in other matters. To give one last example, I mean, currently from the USA, you know, I, I hear many kind of, you know, liberals and Democrats accusing a lot of Republicans of believing fake news and conspiracy theories and being irrational and so forth. But even these Democrats would agree that when it comes to gerrymandering, to gerrymander election uh, um, counties, how do you call it? Like these mm -hmm. uh, yeah. counties? Extremely rational, relying on the latest sociological and economic and whatever tools, being very uh, capable in differentiating reliable from unreliable data. So there is this kind of widespread common assumption the truth will prevail in the end because the people who tend to believe fake news and conspiracy theories and so forth, they don't know how to organize, how to manufacture new weapons, whatever. And that's just not the case humans are able to hold both. In fact, to succeed, you usually need both. So what got, that's, that's the challenge for someone of your optimistic persuasion, which is mm -hmm. how do you harness those capacities that Yuval has talked about in pursuit of uh, positive ends, if you will. Mm -hmm. and, you, and you mentioned earlier that you thought actually the last year might be such a galvanizing force, that it mm -hmm. might have changed people's expectations of government and people's expectations of social change. Can you lay out in what areas that you think you expect that and why, given what you both just said? So let's first say in general that if you go back like 30 years um, to um, the, the, the early 90s, then it was quite fashionable to be a cynic in the West, I think. Cynicism was, was quite popular. So you had bands like Nirvana singing, uh, oh, just entertain us. Or you had the, the movie uh, Fight Club with Brad Pitt, you know, who said, oh, we're just buying stuff we don't need to, uh, what is it, impress people we don't like. That's modern life. <laughs> After the fall of the Berlin Wall, this is what 
capitalism is. You know, this is the end of history. There's nothing left to fight for. We don't have ideals, whatever. We're just enjoying our life. And indeed, if I um, would ask my fellow students, this is like just 10, 12 years ago, um, whether they ever protested in the streets for something like that, only a very small minority would say, yes, I did. If you ask that question in, in universities in the US or the UK and the Netherlands or probably in Israel as well, um, did you protest? Did you participate in a demonstration? Then I think around, what is it? 50% would say, yes, I did. So um, that's, 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 a, that's a genuine shift here. We've seen the Black Lives Matter movement, which is the biggest protest movement in the history of the United States. We've seen the climate justice movement with Greta Thunberg, which really has a genuine influence on politicians and policymakers. In, in Europe, you can see it with uh, the Green Deal. You know, this is the problem with Europeans. We're not very good at coming up with our own slogans and language. You know, we, we just steal them from the Americans. But in terms of actual plans, I think uh, Europeans are doing a, a better job often than, than the Americans. So, yes, that things like that do give me hope. Uh, um, yeah, it sort of becomes more fashionable to actually believe in something, to, um, to believe that things can be different and they don't have to be this way. Well, let's just stick with climate, because that is an area where I think when people are looking for optimism from the last year, they say, well, we've seen what can happen when a low probability or relatively low probability event happens. What about the thing that we know is inevitable if we don't act? Do you think, uh, Yuval, do you share Rutger's view that maybe there has been a shift in our collective desire to do something about climate change? Or is this all still, you know, lots of talk that will go away the minute we can start flying in airplanes again? Um, I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. I mean, at present, it's actually gone down on the agenda of most countries. Yes, I mean, maybe there is a, a, some reduction in, in uh, emissions because there are no less, fewer airplane, airplanes flying. But uh, for the foreseeable future, the economic consequences of this crisis will, I think, dominate uh, politics in many countries. And this is not necessarily good news for, for climate change. I mean, conceptually, yes. It warns people, look, even something, not just low probability, but also um, in terms of mortality, it's relatively, um, it's not an extremely deadly virus. It's not the Black Death. And look what it's doing to the world. So now just try to think what will be the implications of a much bigger uh, problem like climate change. Also, conceptually, it shows that, um, and here I completely agree with you, Ratko, that it shows you that you can change things on a massive scale. That, um, and again, you can stop all flights. You can lock down entire countries. You can actually do that. And uh, life goes on in some way. And this, I would say, may make us more open to radical ideas about how to deal also with climate change. If, if I can add something yeah. to that. You know, what I'm worried about is that even people on, say, the progressive side of, of politics who really worry about climate change, I think they often still underestimate just how much that needs to be done. Um, it's become quite fashionable to talk about, you know, mobilization and to make the comparison with what the United States and what the United Kingdom did during the Second World War, you know, completely transformed their economy for the purpose of building as many tanks and grenades and, 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 and machinery to, to win the war. Um, but I don't think people fully understand what kind of sacrifices that would mean. You know, sacrifices in terms of wealth. So how high does taxation need to go? Well, in the, in the, during the war, in the post-war period, we had marginal tax rates that went as high as 90%. For many people, that's, that's unbelievable, but that's actually doable. You can, uh, you can um, have very high rates of tax and capitalism can still work quite well or even better, actually. But are we willing to pay that price? Um, during the Second World War, there was, for example, also the victory speed uh, vehicles couldn't go faster than 35, you know, to save uh, petrol. Um, in, a, in a way, they also had to limit civil liberties. Uh, freedom of expression was limited in the United States. 
there was this this man, sort of the Jeff Bezos of of the U.S. Ba back then, who didn't really comply with uh, government regulations, and he was dragged out of his office. There is a famous photo of that. Now imagine the Jeff Bezos now being dragged out of his office in Amazon by the U.S. government because he doesn't do enough about climate change. You know, I think we're quite far removed from that. From that uh, point, uh, <laughs> yeah. aren't there just just to push both of you a bit more on this? I mean, one. Two, two factors I suspect are going to be very central. One is what role the United States plays, because it is you know, still, it's the world's biggest economy. The, the approach in terms of serious amounts of money, public money for investment in innovation and R&D would, would change the shape of the global debate. But the second is surely the relationship between the US and China, which leads us to the sort of geopolitical consequences of the last year. There is no way that the world will tackle climate change unless those two countries work together mm -hmm. to to make progress. I, I think that's sort of somewhat incontrovertible. So the question then is, do you think actual cooperation between the superpower of the 20th century and the aspirant power of the 21st is more or less likely? Because that surely helps, needs, is a way of shaping whether we should be more or less hopeful. And, and where are you both on that, on the sort of geopolitical consequences of the pandemic and and whether it makes a, a kind of geopolitics that is more or less dangerous. Yuval. Hmm. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I hope they can cooperate. I agree that without a, a, a cooperation between the USA and China, it will be probably impossible to tackle not just climate change, but the other major uh, threats and challenges we face, like the rise of artificial intelligence and other disruptive technologies. Um, we didn't see a lot of cooperation over the last year. They have been uh, uh, mainly blaming each other and spreading disinformation and, and so forth. So it, it didn't raise my, my hopes. Um, one thing that does raise my hopes is that, you know, traditionally in history, this kind of situation almost inevitably led to a great power, not just competition, to a great power war. But over the last few decades, we have seen a remarkable reduction, not just generally in human violence and international wars, but especially in wars between great powers. There has not been a war between two great powers since the middle of the, of the 20th century. The Second World War, maybe if you, if you count the Korean War. And um, this is not because of accidents, this is because of deep changes in um, the nature of the international system, in the nature of economics and, and technology. Uh, maybe the most important change is that once you have nuclear weapons, and today you have an, you, we are developing equally destructive weapons of, of different kinds, a great power war is mutual suicide. And this was never be before the case in history. Again, there are reasons to be a bit less optimistic now, because, you know, with nuclear weapons, it was obvious that if you start a nuclear war, everybody is going to lose, everybody is going to be destroyed. With the new arms race in areas like cyber technology and AI and, and so forth, there is a temptation that maybe I can win it. That when the other guy presses the button, nothing happens because I hacked their system. The Cold War confrontation between the USSR and the USA, the nuclear confrontation, it was like a chess game. That, you know, it's very cold and rational and you can see forward, if we do this, they will do that. In the current situation, one of the frightening things about the new technologies is that they pour mist over the entire battlefield. You really have no idea what you can do and what the other side can do. You can never really be sure that in the moment of truth, if you press the button, things will actually work. And this raises the, the possibility that somebody will miscalculate or perhaps will calculate correctly that they can win this thing. 
So one of the dangers we are facing is that gr great power conflict can be back on the table. And again, looking at what happened over the last year, we have to be extremely worried because the, basically the whole world went online. The whole world became digital. If you think what a full-scale cyber war looked like, could look like in 2019, it would have been devastating, but you could survive it. Now with everything moving online, we are far more exposed to the dangers of cyber war. Just imagine that that's it. The internet in your country is, is down. Everything is down. And uh, especially in, in a, now in the, in the COVID world or post-COVID world, I mean, nothing works. All the money is gone. I mean, I can't communicate. I mean, I don't even know how to, how to do anything. So in a way, I mean, some people came out of, of 2020 with the impression that, hey, we are more resilient than we were in the past if during the Black Death or during the Spanish influenza of 1918, you close down all the schools, there is no education. There is nothing you can do. The school is shut. What can you do? Now we are more resilient. Yes, the physical school is shut down, but we can continue school online. But actually, it also makes us far more vulnerable. Just try to imagine a cyber war, a full-scale cyber war, under the present conditions. Okay, that's that. Now you've got me feeling very gloomy, Rutger. I need some optimism. <laughs> um, you know, uh, do, do you? Well, actually, I'm going to because we're uh, we're we're getting quite close to running out of time, and I want to move on. And I think this is an area where you will be much more optimistic. Which is, <laughs> has there been a political shift in favor of an idea that you have long argued for, which is that of universal basic income. And it's a question that Irina Bokova has also asked, you know, and she wants to know, in fact, what you, well, your views on this are. But do you sense that we have moved to a world where that kind of discussion is one that is very real and present, and we could actually see a really serious change in the nature of welfare states? Well, the, the amount of change in the discussion around basic income has really been fascinating to witness. You know, just uh, six, seven years ago, when I first started writing and, and, and speaking about the idea, it's obviously a much older idea, right? It goes back like 200 years. But back then, it was pretty much forgotten. And many people here in the Netherlands assumed that I was talking, when I said basic income, they assumed that I was talking about the basic salary of bankers, uh, on top of which they receive all their bonuses. That's what they, they said, you want higher basic salaries for bankers? What are you talking about? Um but that's obviously very different now. I mean, we've seen policymakers and politicians around the world who are interested in the concept. We've seen experiments around the globe. Um, there's really a trend in that direction. Now, I don't think it will happen sort of in an instant that some country will say, OK, let's implement UBI. Let's have a basic income. Let's abolish poverty. I think it will happen much more gradually that we can tr transform our welfare systems in the direction, make them more basic income-ish, you know, make them a bit remove condition conditionalities, uh, make it a little bit more universal, etc. So um, in that sense, I'm quite optimistic. And I think that uh, COVID has accelerated things because uh, governments around the globe have basically been giving people free money, you know, uh, hundreds of dollars. And um, I think that act in itself signifies a certain amount of trust. Because if you really believe that most people would spend it on drugs or alcohol or whatever, then you wouldn't do it. But they have done it, and we found that actually it works pretty well, and that most people, um, um, you know, spend spend the money on reasonable things, because that's obviously one of the great things about money is that people can spend it on things they need, instead of on things that some self-appointed experts uh, think they need. Uh, Yuval, know, what's your take on this? Because it seems to me that this is a really interesting area, mm. and you you spoke of how people have become accustomed to much greater intrusion from government in the pandemic. And you know, mm. maybe this is a pivotal moment also in terms of people's expectation of what, kind, what is provided by government, what the state should do. Is this a kind of 1945 moment? I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's kind of what happened in the UK, right? The welfare state was born after the Second World War. Is that, are we in that kind of a moment now? 
Yeah, I think we are much more open now to the idea that governments should provide more services, should uh, increase the budgets of public services, especially healthcare, and also even ideas like UBI. And, um, you know, interestingly, you see it even in right-wing and conservative parties. I mean, Trump and Boris Johnson also experimented exactly with, with, with these things. So I, I do think there is, is a shift in uh, the zeitgeist around that. Again, to say th something a bit less optimistic, um, my problem is with the notion of universal in universal basic income. Almost always people actually mean national basic mm -hmm. income, not universal basic income. Nobody is saying, okay, we'll tax the rich in California to pay basic income to people in Guatemala. And one of the problems, again, looking at the specific case of what COVID-19 is doing to the world, there is a lot of talk about how we will emerge from this crisis. So somebody says it will be a U-shape uh, curve. Somebody says, no, it will be a V-shape. And I don't know who it, who it was who said, no, it will be a K-shaped. Um, K in the sense that some countries will become much more rich and powerful thanks to all everything that happened in the last year, they will actually emerge from the crisis in a far better condition than they entered it. This is especially the countries that are leading the revolutions in areas like digitalization. And other countries, many countries, they will be the downside uh, half of the K. They might see their economies completely collapse as things are digitalized and automated, many countries that depend on traditional production lines or tourism and so forth, they might completely collapse. And we will see an accelerating inequality on a global level. And it will be much more difficult to bridge, to close this inequality even than the inequality that opened in the 19th century with the Industrial Revolution. So we will see countries like the USA and China becoming far richer and more powerful, dominating the world economy and also the, 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 the political future of the world more than ever before, while other countries basically going bankrupt and becoming new kinds of colonies of, of these new imperial forces. So again, w w universal basic income, I think we will see more of that in countries, certainly in Europe, even in the US. The big question is what will happen in Brazil, in South Africa, in Indonesia, in these countries. Let me just follow on with that um, to try and, I mean, I, I, if you are right, and it's again a very gloomy perspective, but we have this, this, this global fissure between the, the countries that grow richer and stronger and the, those that are completely left behind. Do you sense a greater sense of global solidarity or less? I mean, one of the striking things about the pandemic has been it's been very national. You know, there's been a very clear sense of that this is done one country for each for itself. Um, do you therefore expect that the post-pandemic world will be a, an even less sort of sense of global solidarity or more? It's up to us. I mean, I think in your book, Rodgo, there is this parable of the two wolves that live inside us, the good wolf and the bad wolf. And the question which wolf will win in this internal struggle, it's the wolf you feed. So um, I don't think there is an inevitable outcome to the present crisis. Mm -hmm. I think we have options. And I hope we, made, we make good choices. I mean, um, there in many ways, this crisis should increase global solidarity. I mentioned before the fact that everybody should realize that our health, even if we are completely selfish, it's in our interest to protect the healthcare of every human being on earth. Imagine it like you have a war between the humans and the viruses, the front line passes through the body of every human being on earth. And if the front line is breached anywhere in the world, 
in China, in Brazil, in the UK, it puts everybody in danger. A virus that jumps from some animal to a human in some remote village might be in Wall Street or Beverly Hills or London within a few days. So again, not out of any altruism, out of your own self-interest, you should provide protection and good basic health care to everybody in the world. And another thing is that this pandemic has been a truly global experience. People all over the world, despite many differences, of course, in some essential ways, you know, people all over the world share the same experience. It's like, you know, in, in the US, when, when people can today ask each other, where were you on September 11? Where were you where Kennedy was assassinated? And everybody have this shared experience. So COVID, the, the, the COVID year is really one of the most extreme shared experiences that, that ever happened to humanity. So, Otko, do you think that shared experience um, will lead to a positive outcome? Do you, do you sense more of the likelihood of that than Yuval does? Well, look, we historians always say that we find it hard to, to predict the past. Now, obviously, predicting the future is even more difficult than that. Um, I think my most important point here would, would, would also be that, that we are the stories that we tell ourselves. So cynicism is, I think, another form of laziness that could also become a self-fulfilling prophecy. And uh, it's really about sort of recognizing the potential within human nature. We're obviously not born as cosmopolitans, obviously not. Uh, you could even say we're born as xenophobes. You know, we have these really tribal groupish tendencies. But there's also the possibility within human nature to overcome that. Uh, for example, there's, there's been numerous studies within psychology that if people have more diversity in their life, you know, uh, meet more people from different backgrounds, then they, um, they become a little bit more of that cosmopolitan. Um, and then if you look at younger generations, um, there, there's, there's very interesting evidence from, from Pew, Re Pew Research, for example, that young people right now, both in Europe and the US, are not only the most highly educated uh, uh, generation this world has ever seen, but also the most ethnically diverse and the most progressive. Um, I think that's, that's significant. Sure. You know, In a way, we're, we're, today we're still ruled by politicians and elites who were children from the Cold War, basically, who saw the world in black and white terms, capitalism versus communism, um, market versus the state. Um, and they became a little bit complacent, especially after the end of the, the Soviet Union and the fall of the Berlin Wall. But now there's a new generation coming that looks at this world in a very different way and um, thinks that um, some things are politically possible that were you know, I've seen this completely impossible 10 years ago. Is all of that going to happen? I have no idea. Uh, but I think there is more than enough reason to be hopeful now. OK, well, I'm but, going to end. Sorry, you go ahead. Uh, if I have a, a minute or two to, to, to add something. <laughs> yeah. sure. uh, so just uh, I would shift the kind of line, the, the debate. It's not kind of nationalism versus cosmopolitanism. Mm -hmm. I think that nationalism and globalism can go together that your national interests should make you cooperate in things like stopping pandemics or preventing climate change. And what really worries me when I look at the world right now is not the clash between nationalism and globalism, it's the collapse of nationalism in many countries around the world. And the US is a prime example, but it's not the only one. To have real cooperation on a global level you don't need to overcome nationalism. You actually need to have good, healthy, self-confident nationalism. And what we are seeing, and I don't really understand why, but in country after country, we are seeing the collapse of national communities into warring tribes. Americans now hate and fear each other far more than they hate and fear anybody else on earth the Chinese or the Russians or the, anybody. And I'm seeing it in my home country of Israel. I'm seeing it in Brazil. And I don't really understand why, but I would say this is the real fault line. It's not a clash between nationalism and cosmopolitanism and globalism. 
something is happening to national communities that makes them kind of collapse. And we need them to be self-confident and strong to be able to cooperate. So uh, that's really interesting, and it leads us to uh, what I'm is going to be my penultimate question, because we have 10 minutes left, and I want to end with a penultimate question that is a little um, downbeat and then uh, an upbeat one to end on. And the downbeat one comes actually from Victor Backstrom, who is asking, what do you see as the single largest geopolitical risk in the next few years to come? And what could it be? What could be a potential trigger point, e.g. technology, ideology, religion, clash between rich and poor, disbelief in the state? Choose one of them. What is the, the biggest thing that you are worried about? Rutger? Oh, I'm definitely the most worried about what we're doing, basically to our to the living planet, to our environment. Um, when it comes to the impact of technology, I think we just have to be a bit more agnostic. We just don't know yet. As I said, you know, there was this incredible hype around what algorithms are capable of and Cambridge Analytica. And if you really go into that, often it's, I think, rather unimpressive what they can actually do. Um, online advertising, you know, obviously Facebook wants us to believe that they're incredibly good at controlling our behavior. That's what all marketeers say, you know, I'm the best. I can influence people to do, to buy whatever I want them to buy. But if you look at the actual evidence, you know, from um, economists, for example, psychologists, it's very limited. Uh, the effect of it is very, very small. Um, but when it comes to climate change, I mean, it's, it's so clear that it's simply not sustainable, our lifestyle. And it's, and it's not clear yet if we're going to make this, this transition. What we have to do, and the science is quite clear, we have to do something that has never been done before in peacetime, totally transform the way we live. Everything we do now, how we eat, how we travel, how we live, the houses that we, that we build, every, everything, everywhere, it's all driven by fossil fuels. And that's simply not sustainable. So, um, and, and that you don't really, um, we don't really need more knowledge about that right we've known that for 30 years so or, or even longer than that and and that's what i'm most worried about that's very clear so that's your answer to um to victor's uh, what's the post-pandemic challenge you what is yours what's the single most important thing? i'm much more worried about the technology because i think if we manage the technology correctly it can also solve the climate problem and if we mismanage it um it it will cause an even faster deterioration I mean, with the climate, we have, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 years. With the technology, it, it moves much faster. I, again, I'm also more, uh, more afraid of what the technology can do already today. To take an example close to home, if you're wondering, for example, why Israel's geopolitical position has become much stronger in recent years, and, you know, with the opening to the United Arab Emirates, uh, with the fact you don't hear much about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict anymore. There are several reasons for that, but the number one reason I would say is technology. Israel in recent years, last five, six, ten years, has perfected new surveillance technology that enables it to control millions of people, millions of Palestinians, extremely effectively, with very little overt military force or bloodshed. And this is why its position is much stronger. And this is why a lot of countries are opening, to, they want the technology. And this is not a future scenario. It's happening right now. And the technology is being exported, not just from Israel, but from also other countries all over the world. I think the power of these new technologies of surveillance and control is immense. We haven't really seen anything yet. And uh, if we see, if, if we are entering an AI arms race, it will basically guarantee the worst outcome. That there is no way to regulate these disruptive technologies. And instead of using them, to overcome climate change, they will increasingly be used to enslave humankind. So that's my ma main fear. So that's your sobering main fear. So now the last question to both of you, and I'll go first to you, Yuval. You've told us what your main fear is. What is top of your to-do list? What, should, what is the most important <laughs> thing to be done to ensure that this worst outcome doesn't happen? And assume you were, you know, 
able to affect political change and could get one or two things done to minimize mm. that risk, what would it be? Well, in the immediate future, I would say to have a global plan to deal with the pandemic and with the related economic crisis, not just in order to overcome this immense problem, but also because this will lay a foundation of trust for cooperation on other fronts, like the potential AI arms race and climate change. I think that without global cooperation, we can't really achieve much on any of these fronts. So you would, it would be a push for global cooperation. And Rutger, the last word is yours. What would you have as top of your to-do list? Well, you know, let me tell you this, this little anecdote. I think two years ago, I was invited to go on a book tour in uh, Korea to talk about my previous book, Utopia for Realists. And um, what happens is that you go there, you fly in from, and then you're on the, in the, the airport, you go to the taxi to the hotel and you do your first interview. And I remember very well the moment that a journalist asked me some question about Korean politics. Um, and I heard myself starting to formulate an answer. And then I realized, what am I doing? I know absolutely nothing about <laughs> Korean politics. <laughs> so this is sometimes the problem is that as a writer, you, at some point you start to overestimate all, all your knowledge. And that especially happens when people start to ask you the question, but what should I do? You know, what's the solution to all of my problems? Here's the thing. I believe that once you update your view of human nature, once you look at humans in a different way, you can do things in a, in a, in a quite di different way. So in my book, I give a couple of case studies and examples of how you can reorganize education. Maybe you can, that you can get rid of the hierarchical school system and rely more on the intrinsic motivation of kids. You can also restructure the workplace, you know, more, more in self-directed teams, um, have basically a lot less hierarchy and a lot less inequality and things may even work better. You can reimagine how democracy is done, et cetera, et cetera. But these are just examples because I don't know what happens if a lot, if millions of people around the world have a little bit more hopeful view of human nature. I'm, I'm pretty sure that it will have profound implications, but as a writer, I don't know sort of what all the effects will be because people will have to find that out in their own life. It, it sounds to me as though top of your to-do list is to have everybody read your book because then they would have an <laughs> well, understanding that. Of would that. be a little bit dumb. Maybe people but, should start with Yuval's I, book first, but that's I, I, you already I, read that one. <laughs> I, I, am, I, am, I am jesting, I'm teasing you, but um, that is, I think, a wonderfully upbeat place and both of your to-do lists, I think, are excellent. One is, one is more ambitious than the other, but certainly having, a, having Rutger's upbeat and sunny view of human nature and Yuval's call to global cooperation seemed to me to be uh, an excellent place to end on. I'm not sure we have lived up to the intellectual inauguration of the year, but I have had a fascinating time listening to the two of you. I hope all of you watching have enjoyed this. Um, the discussion will be put up on YouTube, so please do tell anybody who you think might be interested. Uh, it is wonderful to hear two such swashbuckling minds um, give us a sense of where the world has come from and some sense of where it is going. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you. Thanks.